2020 has been a year like no other. Once in a century pandemic shook the world, it has been a year full of surprises, but not the ones anyone asked for. Over 100 million people in India lost their jobs by the end of March when a lockdown was imposed to combat COVID-19. Since then, many who managed to hold on to their jobs were forced to take pay cuts. Ritu Singh looks back at the year that was for India's job market and finds that employment rate has been falling since 2017. Take a look. अचानक लॉकडाउन होने के चक्कर से बहुत हम लोग बुरी तरीका से चल रहा हूँ हाथ में कोई पैसा नहीं है खाने पीने का बहुत कष्ट हो रहा है हम लोग तो वापस नहीं आएंगे देर नो फुटफॉल्स नो वॉक इन्स एंड इट इज हैविंग वेरी बिग कैस्केडिंग इफेक्ट फिफ्टी थाउजेंड शॉप यू कैन इमेजिन यू नो एटलीस्ट इज अफेक्टेड मोर देन टू लैक पीपल आई कैन से हमको भी कुछ मुश्किल है ना कहाँ का पैसा आएगा आपको रोजगार देने के लिए पचास हजार करोड़ रुपए खर्च किए जाने बहुत बड़ा सपना दिया सच्चाई निकली चौदह करोड़ लोगों को नरेंद्र मोदी जी की पॉलिसीज ने बेरोजगार बना दिया The jobs crisis has been one of the biggest economic, political and social issues that dominated 2020. The full extent of the impact of COVID-19 on jobs and employment is still unfolding. Let's take a look at a few figures to give you a sense of what happened to jobs when the pandemic struck. Now, the unemployment rate, which is a proportion of labor force that fails to find employment, jumped to 23.52% immediately after the lockdown in April. But as things improved, it fell to about 6.51% as of November. Now, this unemployment rate is actually lower than last year's pre-COVID figures, but that is hardly a cause for celebration, and I'll tell you why. Now, unemployment may be falling, but the labor force itself is shrinking. Labor participation rate had actually never fallen below 42% until the lockdown. It averaged about 42.7% in the last financial year, but it has been on a downtrend since the pandemic struck, and it seems to be heading towards a sub-40% level now. This is worrying because it shows that people are so discouraged by the conditions that they'd rather sit out and not participate in the jobs market. Now, one would assume if unemployment is falling, employment must be rising in tandem. But that is again not the case. The employment rate has actually been falling since 2016-17 and it was recorded at about 39.4% in the last financial year. It dropped after the lockdown as more and more people lost jobs and this was at about 36.4%. 2% in the third week of November. Now, this is even lower than last year's level, and employment rate is the best measure of the summary health of an economy, and therefore this is another bad sign. Now, employment has fallen by 113.6 million. That was immediately after the lockdown, and it seemed to be recovering hesitatingly, but again, it's now started to decline. In October, the count of employed had fallen by about 0.6 million. In November, this was much larger by about 3.5 million. So the deterioration of labor metrics in November is a signal again of the early exhaustion of the recovery process that began in late May this year. The recovery is not yet complete. The employment rate never reached its pre-COVID levels. And before reaching there, it started to decline again. Besides, half a dozen states, including some of the large and relatively industrialized ones, are still reporting double-digit jobless rates. So who has actually suffered the most? To give you that answer, let's first take a look at the distribution of jobs, where all the salary jobs together account for about 22% of the total employment in India. There are many more farmers than salary jobs, and there are even more daily wage laborers. Farmers and daily wage earners together account for about two-thirds or 66% of the Indian working population, and the others are about 12%. Now, people with salary jobs were the biggest losers as of August this year. An estimated 21 million salaried employees lost their jobs as of the end of August. 11 million daily wage laborers had also lost their job thanks to the pandemic. But farming seems to have been the last resort of some of these job losers during the lockdown because by August, the number of employees Employment and farming had increased by about 14 million. The lockdown also saw a rise of entrepreneurs with about 7 million increase in the number of jobs. To put everything together, 
the labor force itself has shrunk by about 16 million, which is the people who are employed plus the unemployed who are actively looking for work. But the greater labor force, which captures those who are willing to work but not looking for any work because they are disillusioned, that has seen a reduction of almost 5 million. And these 5 million potential workers have left the labor force entirely. And that is the tragedy of this pandemic. Ritu Singh, thanks very much. That was 2020 for the jobs market. But the year will also be remembered as a year when India and China relations went through a very hard reset. Embroiled in a border standoff in eastern Ladakh since May, 20 Indian soldiers were killed in June in what was the worst clash between Indian and Chinese troops seen in the last 45 years. The Chinese side also suffered casualties. India has retaliated by banning Chinese apps and putting Chinese investments under greater scrutiny. Nine months since the border tensions began, began lakhs of Indian and Chinese troops remain deployed at the LAC. China has refused to pull back troops from Indian positions and instead wants India to accept the new status quo. So will the LAC standoff pan out in 2021 in a way that benefits India? Parikshit Lutra looks for some answers. Indian troops prepared for a long and harsh winter in eastern Ladakh, where temperatures fall as low as minus 12 degrees Celsius in December. 2020 has seen the heaviest deployment at the Indo-China border since the 1962 war. Objecting to ramped up construction of roads and bridges by India on its side of the line of actual control, China began increasing troop presence at the LAC. This began in April and in early May there were two violent face-offs, one at Pangong So in Ladakh and one at Nakula, Sikkim the Chinese were making territorial claims more aggressively than ever before. They entered Indian territory in Galwan and Pangong So and had come close to Indian positions in other areas along the border. On 15th June, Colonel Santosh Babu and his men from 16 Bihar, who had gone to ask the Chinese to remove a post from the Indian territory in Galwan, were violently attacked by Chinese soldiers, armed with nail-studded iron rods. 20 Indian soldiers, including their commanding officer, Santosh Babu, died in these violent clashes. The worst in 45 years. But not before causing significant casualties to the Chinese side. China's aggression was condemned globally, with the US drawing parallels with China's aggression in South China Sea. By seizing vantage points in Ladakh, because in doing so, it has ensured enmity with India for at least the next one generation has also ensured that the relationship with India, far from being repaired, will be under strain and that the Chinese access to the Indian market is going to be on the decline. India demanded that China restore the status quo. The Prime Minister visited Ladakh and sent a strong message to China. <laughs> Fire! The border tensions also led to a reset in economic ties, with calls for boycott of Chinese goods. India has banned more than 250 Chinese apps and has put curbs on Chinese investments. Despite talks between foreign ministers, diplomats and military commanders, there is no let-up in tensions on the ground. Between 28th August and 7th September, Chinese troops attempted to capture Indian positions in South Pangong, even firing shots at Indian soldiers. But they were pushed back by Indian special forces. On the 10th of September, External Affairs Minister Subramaniam Jayashankar and Foreign Minister Wang Yi met in Moscow and India and China arrived at a five-point consensus to ease border tensions. Despite eight rounds of high-level military talks, Chinese forces have so far refused to pull back. Maintaining peace and stability, peace and uh, tranquility on the, uh, on, along the line of actual control is the basis for the rest of the relationship to progress. So you can't have the kind of situation you have on the border and say, well, let's carry on with life, you know, in all other sectors of activity, it's, it's just unrealistic. So, very frankly, the relationship this year has been, uh, I would say, very significantly damaged. 
India too is digging in for the long haul with troops and weapon systems. India is going to now launch a major military build-up. This will include this will include vastly increased frontier patrols and additional mountain warfare forces. And we have seen in recent weeks that India has been carrying out a series of leading-edge missile systems tests. And I think India's military build-up will also include significant expansion of its naval capacity. Today, China has deployed thousands of troops along Indian positions in eastern Ladakh. Getting China to pull back is a massive military and diplomatic challenge for India. But the incidents of 2020 are bound to have a historical impact on economic and political relations between India and China. In New Delhi, Parikshit Lutra. Well, the year of a hard reset. But 2020 also saw the centre cross swords with states and most state governments. Again, it was the fragile goods and services tax that was at the crux of the dispute. Things did come to a head when the government threw its hands up and said that the prolonged lockdown had left its coffers empty. And with near zero balance in the GST compensation fund, it meant that states could not be compensated. CNBC TV 18's Tim Zijay Puria recounts the skirmish that ended with most states tapping up. Take a look. You're facing an act of God, which might even result in a contraction of the economy. An act of God. That is probably the most telling statement from the government as it contemplated not just a contraction in the economy, but an inability to meet its legal obligations to states when it comes to GST compensation. The act of God defense caused quite a bit of furor and led to further escalating tensions between the states and the centre. Finance Minister Sita Raman's explanation to a near standstill to the economy due to pandemic and resultant lockdown had caused a major shortfall in the GST compensation kitty did not go down well with the states. Nor did the fact that the government towards the end of a long GST council meeting on the 27th August blindsided the state FMs with two options to make up for this shortfall. Both entailed borrowing to make up the deficit. Option 1 entailed the states borrowing directly to bridge the shortfall through a special RBI window. But the catch was that the centre would only count 97,000 crore rupees as the centre's due to states due to GST. The rest of the 1.30 lakh crore rupee shortfall was billed as losses due to COVID-19, which was not the centre's problem. The option said this borrowed amount would be repaid through future compensation cess collections and would not be counted as state's debt. Option 2 proposed that states borrowed the entire 2.35 lakh crore rupees and bear the interest burden, while the principal would be repaid from future cess collections. However, while 97,000 crore rupees would not be counted as state's debt, the rest of 1.38 lakh crores would. 20 states chose option 1. The others had apprehensions and insisted that drawing a distinction between GST-related revenue shortfall and COVID-19-induced shortfall was fallacious. Out of the blue, hmm. it brings a new concept, new issue, that the shortfall in revenue has to be uh, uh, categorized in those related to COVID and those related to normal shortfall. And yeah. COVID is a godsend event <laughs> for which uh, central government or nobody can be held accountable for. The Constitution yeah. doesn't make this distinction. So I objected to it yeah. very seriously and perhaps reacted a bit too angry. Eventually, the GST Council approved increased the borrowing limit to 1.10 lakh crore rupees from the earlier 97,000 crore rupees and on the 5th of October, extended the levy of compensation cess beyond the original June 2022 deadline to ensure the borrowing could be repaid. But there was still no consensus on how the borrowing would be effected, with states like West Bengal, Kerala, Punjab insisting that since the centre was obligated to pay states, it should do the borrowing. The centre, of course, had its arguments ready. Center has issued a borrowing calendar. If I go beyond that to borrow, 
it would immediately jack up the bond yields. The GSEC yields will go up. And if GSEC yields are the ones which are used as benchmark for every other borrowing in the country, the states going for borrowing on any other score, not just the compensation, would end up paying a very high price. The borrowing cost will go up. So will be the borrowing of even the private sector. If the GSEC rate is going to go up because I'm gone beyond my borrowing calendar, it's going to affect everybody's borrowing. To help these arguments go down easier, the finance minister unveiled a special interest-free 50-year loan window for states to carry out 12,000 crore worth of capital expenditure. This worked somewhat, but it still left 10 states and union territories opposed to becoming borrowers. It looked like the centre would not budge, and so it came as a bit of surprise when, on the evening of 13th October, the government announced a special window to borrow 1.10 lakh crore rupees towards meeting GST compensation dues. It also waived the reforms condition it had previously set forth if states were to avail additional borrowing to the tune of 0.5% of GSTP. Gradually, more states came on board. On the 5th of December, Jharkhand became the last state to choose an option. And with that, all states have chosen to go with option 1. In New Delhi, Tim C. Jaipuria. Well, the GST impasse coming to an end. Up next, the good, the bad and the ugly are working from home. We bring you two contrasting tales as millions went about their jobs from the comfort of their couch. While it was not so comfortable for some, a special report coming up. Welcome back to Rewind 2020, where we recap the year that was. Now, if this year in COVID-19 taught us anything at all, it's about how we could work from home over an extended period of time. And while the jury may still be out on just how effective work from home is, we bring you two contrasting stories from Chennai and Delhi on how working from home worked out in two different ways for two different people. Here's the story of Neha and of Abu and their work from home journeys. My son is, he was one year, a little over one year when the pandemic hit us, so um, he still had five, you know, meals to take and I had a full-time job, uh, my husband had a full-time job. It took us nearly two months to get into a routine. Shira, what does a dog do? Puff. Yes. They have been painting. Hi, this is Neha Nadkarni Pai. Uh, I have lived in Bombay all my life. Then I moved to um, Pune post my marriage. Prati got a job, my husband got a job in Chennai and uh, he asked me if he want to make this, uh, you know, move. I came here and um, with a little one who was just seven months old and we, we, we were trying to figure our life and figure this city out. The first month, I think the companies were also, and so I mean my company was not uh, any different. It wasn't used to this system of working from home. So what was work from home? We didn't have any protocols in place. But I think we took to it like, you know, how fish takes to water. We just sort of uh, learned to adapt to this new chain. Slowly and steadily what, you know, started off as maybe we'll not be able to do. It, it's become so seamless now. There were times when my husband would uh, be on his calls and take Shorya on the pram and move about while I would cook. And as soon as he would go on a call, I would, you know, then uh, take over, look after Shorya. Uh, we need to take care of ourselves on our own. The independence and the dependency that needs to be reduced on others is something that has taught me. And that, that's something I will never forget. I am Abu and I am a trained architect and I run this company called DIARC which is an architectural consultancy firm. Right now we are a team of six people. We were not anticipating that uh, we will be stopped from coming to the office uh, all of a sudden like that. The digital connectivity through uh, various uh, uh, 
portals like Zoom and all was not working quite well for us. And it uh, started hampering the pace of work and uh, all the uh, works where, you know, duplication of work was happening. I logged out from work from home mode in uh, July and because, you know, we were not able to cope with the digital environment, uh, some call drops and also uh, clients started becoming very demanding. Uh, benefits of work from office is that you have a schedule, first of all, then uh, there is a communication between the team. You know, ideas cannot be shared on a digital space. Suddenly you have come with an idea which can, you know, work a lot, but you need to draw and see and sketch. Uh, if you are uh, together with your team, somebody who is doing the work over there can, you know, also give you a lot of input that, you know, uh, that they have got from the client interaction when they were with the clients. I do not want to go back to uh, work from home mode as it will, you know, increase a lot of pressure. Uh, the challenges that we face will remain the same. Well, work from home became a necessity for millions across the world. But the question is, will it be the normal come 2021? Well, that's a wrap on this edition of Rewind 2020. Here's wishing everyone a happy, a Merry Christmas, a prosperous and a safe New Year. We hope that uh, 2021 brings us better news on all fronts, especially on the health front. Stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. The news will continue from all of us here. Goodbye. Many thanks for watching.